very much and thank you for all coming here today. I've never spoken in a tent before, so if you can't hear me at the back, if I start getting lost, just wave at me and I'll pitch up again. Um, it is a real honour and privilege to be here today and a little bit uh, daunting as well. I think when I got the invitation originally, my first thought was, uh, do people want to hear about what Stonewall has to say on these themes? Do people want to hear what I have to say on these themes? And am I Christian enough for a Christian festival? <laughs> because there's something about being a lesbian Catholic, which means that as one of the very few Catholics who never uses contraception, that doesn't actually <laughs> tip you into a category of being a theologian. And I am no theologian. So if any of you are here today expecting to see a full in-depth analysis of the background to Greek translations of Leviticus and its implications on 17th century moralizing about the demise of the Catholic Church, that's not going to come from me, I'm afraid. I am rooted in the notion that God is love, and where God is love, that should be our start point and our end point. I'm going to talk a bit about Stonewall and where we've come from and our ethos and how we work. I'm going to talk a bit about me and my ethos, and where I come from, and where I work. And then, competing with what can only be described as God Rock, I am going to talk about where I think the movement for LGBT acceptance within the church is going from here. And there are a lot of exciting things happening, and I want to be able to share some of that with you. So, Stonewall was set up 26 years ago in response to something called Section 28, Section 28 was a piece of legislation that prevented the promotion of homosexuality. It suggested that families who had more than one gay person were pretend and that any books depicting such families should be banned. Now, for those of you who've done basic history, banning books never works out well for any kind of cultural movement. But we were at a time where there was significant change happening in relation to race, disability and gender but a retrograde step in relation to sexual orientation. That led to a fourth generation of LGB people who'd experienced oppression because of who they were. The first level, the older generation had been told that who they are was illegal, that they weren't allowed to be in relationships, that they were persecuted by police, arrested for grievous bodily harm and cottaging. The next generation were told they were responsible for HIV, this new generation were told that they were pretend. And this fourth generation now has all that legacy on our shoulders as we look at what has been the most rapid, radical transformation of LGB equality that we've ever seen. Alongside, in terms of gender identity, around the similar time of Stonewall's forming, a group of trans activists got together with civil servants and peers and they said, you need to set up an organisation that changes the law. They set up Press for Change, we set up Stonewall. And the two of us decided to be highly strategic, highly pragmatic, very non-democratic. There was no talking about what we might think about splitting hairs, about what equality looks like. We went, this is the agenda, and this is what we're going to do. And Stonewall identified ten legal changes, and Ian McKellen, a.k.a. Gandalf, took that to John Major, and John Major said, I will deliver you every single one of these legislative changes. Things didn't work out well for John, um, but Tony Blair came along and Tony Blair said, I will deliver each and every one of those legal changes. And where the gay rights movement was at that stage, and I use that word deliberately, was all about assimilation. It was all about saying, we are absolutely as good as you, straight people. We want to get married like you. We want to have babies like you. Look how normal we are. Normal, normal, normal. Normal gay people. Normal, normal, normal. And basically try to make the notion of LGBT as safe as possible. And we hid a lot of the complexity. We said, don't worry too much about the complexity. We're just like you. Because what we were convincing was heterosexual MPs, heterosexual peers, chief execs of businesses, big banks, big corporations to basically go, yeah, it's all right to be gay, actually. And that was not an easy conversation to be having. So Stonewall 10 years ago were having conversations where people would say, we have no gay staff. And we'd say, yes, you do. 
And then they would say, yes, we've got gay staff, we've spoken to them, and he's really happy. And we'd go, okay. And then the third stage, we'd go, do you have a, um, an LGBT network? And they'd say, yes, we've got three gay men who go to the pub every Friday and talk about how hard it is to be gay. Fourth generation, yes, we've now discovered we've got a lesbian as well. And the lesbian <laughs> has started to do some of that work. And all that time, we ignored what we call intersectionality. We ignored that people might have more than one component to their identity. And so it was perpetuated that people of faith were not LGBT and people of faith were generally hostile about LGBT. And that very basic situation had to be maintained in order to stop every piece of legislation being defeated by, by the bishops. So this was a strategic decision. It was, you keep your religious freedom, you're allowed to decide what you want in terms of LGBT people, but let us have civil marriage. Let us adopt. Let us foster. Lesbians having babies, don't you... That's not a God issue. Don't you worry about it. It's just about a bit of sperm. Chill out. <laughs> Stripping out any element of faith, spirituality, compassion... Christianity, any of those faith elements. We flirted with it in relation to civil partnerships being allowed to happen in religious premises. So the geeks amongst you, that was a time when we pushed that CP should be able to be conducted in religious premises for those who want it. It was an absolute illogical bit of legislation. But basically what it demonstrated was that civil partnerships and marriage were the same thing. So it was a strategic move. I would love to say it was about recognising the needs of faith communities, but it was a strategic move. So time has passed. We've now got marriage. The Gender Recognition Act is due for comprehensive reform, which we're really pleased about. And I took over as chief executive a year ago. So my story, I'm 35. I came out at 14, maybe 13, certainly snogging girls at 12, but that's, not, that's part of a different journey. Um, so came out around that time and that was around the same time and I, it's, it's very odd talking about very personal things in this space because it's a big field but, but I'll try. Um, I was brought up Catholic, went to Catholic school, me and my brother both were, uh, received our first Holy Communion and our relationship with the church was as normal and as regular as our relationships with our school, our relationship with our friends, it was part of our fabric of our life. And at that stage in adolescence where we might have drifted off, my um, aunt, who was also my godmother, died in childbirth and left three very small kids, a four-year-old, a two-year-old and a little baby. And those children went to the same Catholic school that me and my brother had gone to. And what happened was that Catholic church wrapped itself around us as a family and wrapped itself around us and our pain and the shock and the experiences that were too much for a teenager coming to terms with their sexuality. So as I read the Bible more, and I read the Bible a lot, I found a lot of God for me. There was a lot that I took from my faith. And my relationship with the Catholic Church could sometimes be described as a little childlike. It is certainly rooted in those principles of love and light and treating their neighbour as we treat each other. I believe in the one holy Catholic Church. I believe in transubstantiation. Those are all part of the fabric of my life. But as I read that Bible, nothing was discordant for me about my burgeoning loving of women. There was nothing that I read that made me go, ooh, I can't have this faith anymore, because what I read was about Ruth and Naomi, and where you go, I will go, where your people are, my people. And... That's not a lesbian relationship by any stretch of the imagination, but it recognises the value that relationships between women can have. I read about Jonathan and David. I was struck by the fact that Moses got the gig because his brother wasn't very good at public speaking. That really chimed with me. Um, that's what I took from the Bible. I never took, gosh, I better not be an active homosexual, otherwise I can't be a Catholic anymore. That's not how it worked for me. And every priest I met where I was talking about life and death and big issues... And by the way, I think I fancy my friend. None of them said, let's focus on your homosexuality. They all said, let's focus on the notion of light and love, God and love. Where is love? What do those three little kids need? How can you draw the strength you need to be a good godmother to these three little children who've lost their mother? So that was the basis of my faith. I went to um, Oxford at 18 
um, but was very politically involved and very active as a student politician, so went to the local Catholic churches with local parishioners. Because the thing about Oxford, everything you do is overtly political. If I'd gone to the Oxford University Catholic Society, I'd have had to be a really big, good Catholic. And I'm not a theologian. I was, however, a really good student politician. So I would go secretly to Saturday Mass and then go out on the piss like every other student. That was kind of how it worked in those days. When I left Oxford and got more and more into student politics, more and more into politics, came to Stonewall at the age of 25, faith didn't have a role in that movement or that campaign. And so I learned to suppress that side of my personality and foreground other parts. Now, one of the things we know at Stonewall is that secrets are absolutely toxic. Not being able to be yourself with your friends, your family, your parishioners, your staff, your colleagues, technically speaking, messes with your head. And so at Stonewall, what we talk very much about is about connecting your values. And we know that being LGBT leads to a decision that you make to be yourself, even though you risk losing your friends, your family, your parish, your congregation. You risk everything in order to be yourself. And I wasn't risking everything to be myself in terms of my faith. It was a very contradictory time for me. And then one night I was on the press phone, so the press phone goes to different people, and I'd, I was, it was a Sunday morning, I was sleepy, phone rang, uh, they're closing the Catholic masses, what does Stonewall think about that? And I said, it's terrible that the Soho masses are going, it's really important that Catholics have a place to go where they can be themselves. And they said, well, how would you know that? And I said, well, I'm a Catholic, and I believe it. Right. Deputy Chief Executive of Stonewall, open Catholic, off we go. And I was like, Christ, I'm not even a very good Catholic. I don't even know how to do this. I don't know it. I don't know it well enough to suddenly be thrust into this role as an open Catholic gay rights campaigner. And so I ummed and ahed a bit with it. But as I, when I became Chief Executive, it was the thing that the Independent lived with, and it's more and more what people talk to me about. So in a kind of here-I-am-Lord moment... I felt I had a responsibility as chief executive to be conscious and congruent with my faith and make that part of, an explicit part of, the way in which I lead and the way in which I work with Stonewall. So Stonewall's at an interesting point. Half our people, mainly the people who donate to us, so Stonewall takes no government money. Stonewall receives all its funding from people who give us £10 a month, £20 a month. Those people said, but it's all right now. I'm all right now. I can get married, I've got dis dissolved my civil partnership already, I'm already on to my second one, that's how equal we are, I don't need Stonewall anymore. And what we've had to say is, well, you still don't feel safe on the night bus, well done for being rich enough to get an Addison Lee, you still wouldn't feel safe enough if you worked on zero hour contracts in the middle of nowhere, you still wouldn't be safe enough if you're from a black and minority ethnic background, or you're disabled, or you're transitioning in your gender, all the things that make us the beautiful, wonderful LGBT community, you are only probably equal now if you're what we describe as a good gay. And a good gay is someone who's not too camp, um, certainly not too butch if you're a lesbian, normal, normal, normal. And what Stonewall had to acknowledge is that we are a beautiful, wonderful, diverse, complex community. And actually... If we look at where oppression is coming from, faith communities are both a source of love and light for LGBT people, but also a source of oppression, discrimination, hurt, pain, and heightened anxiety about who we are and what we do. And so Stonewall took the decision that we had to play a part in looking at faith communities and LGBT identity. And I took the very serious decision that I had to be part of that publicly too. So this is where we've got to. Stonewall is now in a place where we are looking very strategically about how we can help faith communities get their head around the LGBT thing. We are very aware that there is an obsession about LGBT issues from faith leaders that is not necessarily reflected in congregations up and down the country. There seems to be a real preoccupation with willies in the bishops and the synod that just doesn't translate into the lived experience. And I go to my local Catholic church in Brixton, and there is nothing. There is no discussion about sexual orientation. 
And the thing about Catholics, we don't talk about our sin openly anyway. We're all very coy about our privacy. We come together and we pray. This preoccupation with sexual orientation and gender identity is generally positioned with the hierarchy. So we have to look about how we can amplify the voices of people of faith, people of Christian faith, who are heterosexual and who are LGBT. And Stonewall is in the business of empowering individuals to start telling their stories. We run role model programs, leadership programs, allies programs, bring you together for a day to talk about your story, your truth. And talk about the fact that my faith is important to me and it is important to me for this reason. And it is congruent with my sexual orientation and gender identity because that is who I am and God made me in this way. And helping people tell those stories and amplify those voices. And Stonewall takes that responsibility incredibly seriously. Is that frozen? It's fro it's fr I'm not saying this is the most random weekend of my life. But it's having its moments, I swear. Um, so we have got together with uh, several, several individuals drawn from LGBT Christian organizations. And we've started the establishment of what we've called the LGBTI mission. And the LGBTI mission will be working to secure equality for LGBT people, specifically in the Church of England. We really hope that the LGBT Christian organizations, of which there are many and varied, endorse this and get on board with it. Now, Christians are renowned for their ability to agree on micro issues. So I'm really looking forward to the discussions <laughs> that are gonna come about what's said in what departments and which. But basically the manifesto falls into three main areas, living, loving, and serving. And in terms of living, we talk about the importance of LGBT people being able to live an authentic life where their faith is part of their identity, where young people in schools are able to be themselves, where we work with schools to find a way to support that, where people are able to be who they are in all areas of their life. We talk about the importance of liturgies and about how liturgy should be available for significant moments in LGBT people's lives, whether that's for someone trans who is, wants to have a new baptism or whether that's for a funeral for someone who is trans wanting the right to be buried in their real name whether it's about a Christian who wants to go through confirmation with their same-sex partner. All those different elements. Also looking at serving, how we can make sure that LGBT uh, chaplains, vicars, can go through the process, don't experience discrimination, aren't being dropped off at different junctions and are able to progress their career. There is something around that on partnership rights, but one of the things we're very aware of is that this whole agenda can be dominated by discussions about marriage. And what I would urge everyone to do is realize that marriage is not the be all and end all. It is not the final goal. And it enables everyone to talk to the cows come home without any conclusion. There will always be discussions about marriage and partnership rights, but we are more concerned about what happens to the young gay Christian when they come out in that school, in that youth group. We are more concerned about how the gay teacher is able to be themselves. We will see those changes happening in terms of partnership rights. And just a note on international at this stage, everybody got very excited about Ireland and the result in Ireland. And Ireland was a really important result. And it was a really important result because heterosexual Catholics, generally women, said, shut up, of course we should let people marry. It's a very important symbolic moment. But from our perspective, it was also a deeply concerning moment because never should the question of LGBT equality be put to a vote. And if we've set a precedent where Catholic countries feel they can vote on whether or not we should be entitled to our rights, frankly, we're screwed, folks, because it ain't all going to go the way of Ireland. And we've set a precedent that says we believe this should be a decision made by the people. No. So we've got to be very careful that we don't just think about marriage, we think about hate crime, we think about employment, we think about chaplaincies, we think about our rights to be ourselves, and we think about Africa as well. And we think about the role that the Church of England plays in increasing the tolerance, the love, the light of people who are different and other, rather than just talking about marriage. So at Stonewall, you won't hear us talking much about religious marriage. You will hear us talking a lot about liturgies, 
You'll be talk- hearing us talk a lot about the right for gay parents to have their children baptised and christened. You'll hear us talking about how wrong it is that vicars decline last rights to gay people. That's the kind of thing you're going to be hearing from us. And hopefully, working together on the LGBTI mission, there will be ways for you to get involved too. So where I want to finish is that it is absolutely crucial that if you can, you find your voice. Whether you are LGBT or heterosexual, we need more people saying, love, light, God accepts and loves everyone, and we are part of this discussion. We may have theological disagreements upon the fundamental nature of marriage. Now, the Church of England is not unfamiliar with having intensive discussions and redefining marriage. Let's be honest. Okay? Now, the Catholics, a bit more twitched about it. But let's remember that the Church of England are pretty cool at adjusting the rules. And the thing about the Church of England is that it strongly welcomes theological diversity. It is its greatest strength. And it has found a way to accept theological diversity in relation to women bishops. There is an acceptance that there are some people within the Church of England who are not going to be cool about the woman bishop thing. We found a way around that. We've got to find a way around theological diversity, around sexual orientation, gender identity, human sexuality. Because if we continue to be draconian about what you must think and must do and who you must and must not kiss, you are going to lose people. People will leave. And that is not what Jesus wanted. It's not what God wanted. So find your voice, tell your stories, and be a positive role model. If you are heterosexual, actively tell people how you feel about LGBT issues. Because you never know who in your congregation is waiting to hear that permission from you. Also, I would finally say, each and every one of you here has extraordinary power. You have power and privilege. You have power and privilege that has enabled you to come here, to afford to be here, to have the space to sit here and listen and reflect. There are three people back home who don't have that power and privilege. Share. Share your thinking. Share your learning. Share what you're working on with those people who don't have that privilege. Because only then will we start really living our values, really living what spirituality and Christianity means to us and finding a way of actually amplifying the voices of those who are currently being drowned out by people who are overly preoccupied with gay bishops. There will always be gay bishops. They're on their own journey. Let it go. And find a way to make your voice count more. So, that's what Stone was about. There are a huge number of LGBT Christian organisations. If you are an ally, find them, join up, sign up. If you are LGBT, become part of that movement too. And please do keep an eye on the LGBTI mission because we are going to need all hands on deck to basically transform the way in which LGBT people are regarded in the Church of England. And we can do it. And that will have a knock-on effect, not only in Britain, but internationally and in other faith communities too. Thank you very much.